Hello, everyone. It's nice to see you again today. Wish I could see your actual faces, but I like to see that people are here. Today, we have a really neat interview. Uh, actually, I don't think we've ever not had a neat interview. We've been very blessed with many really interesting and kind and good people to interview on a variety of topics. And today is definitely another one of those good days. Before we get started, I want to mention one of my favorite products from Natural Hope Herbals, which is De-Stress with Hemp. Now, Natural Hope Herbals is a very solid company in the heart of Pennsylvania, where they have, uh, they have beautiful gardens and a beautiful farm in the middle of a forest. It's so stunning. They grow all of their herbs organically and naturally on this farm, and then they take them to the processing facility, which I have personally also toured and I'm very impressed with. And there they properly pro process everything that they harvest, and they uh, I, I just am blown away. I'm probably going to actually do another recorded walk through their facility I attempted that once and lost sound. So we'll try it again. But in the meantime, this is one of my favorite products. I've told you before about Energizing Morning Blend, which probably is my most favorite product of theirs of, of all. But they also have a line of hemp products. And this is one that I rely on quite heavily because uh, in all seriousness, life does get stressful. And sometimes I just need to breathe a little bit. And this does help. I forgot to take it last night before I went to bed and I was wishing I had, but it does help me relax enough. It helps the brain to calm down so I can go to sleep. So if you get stressed out and you're having trouble like many of us do in today's world and you just need to be able to breathe a little bit easier, De-Stress with Hemp by Natural Hope Herbals is a product that I cannot recommend enough. That aside, I'm going to welcome our guests now, Lady and Patrick Hamilton. I am so happy to have you on today. Um, you have fascinating stories to tell, and I stay, say stories because first we're going to talk about Lady and all of the things that she's gone through. And Patrick, I'm so excited to talk to you about what you have accomplished and what you've learned and are and are continuing to learn to help other people, including your wife and your children. But I'm going to let you tell a little bit about yourselves. So to get rolling, Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself first? I think there's a delay. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Patrick. Obviously. Yeah. So my name is Patrick. I have a master's in pharmacology. I have a bachelor's in nursing. I have two associate degrees that have all started to encompass later in life. I have many years of emergency medicine under my belt. The vast majority of that is one of the, the things that I attribute most throughout my life is the fact that almost all of my emergency medicine experience is through volunteer. I oh. have always throughout my life in some way, shape or form committed my life to volunteer work. And that includes all the way up through my foster time with my children. I adopted three medically fragile children, my wife and I did. And that helped me to progress being able to deal with their situation, their unique situations, their health needs and everything helped me to help push me to continue my health care, health care career to the point that, like I said, I, I've got a vast amount of knowledge that's going on now. And I have really been able to open my eyes to the natural resources that are out there rather than always using the pharmaceutical resources and understanding the reasons between the two has really become essential given the, like I said, the, the children were medically fragile. My beautiful wife has had her fair share of health issues as well. And so therefore, as well as myself, I mean, I have a, so quite a bit of cardiac that, that I have had to restructure my 
health and my intake and my points of view in in life in order to be able to manage all those health situations. And I think that, that being able to express to people all over the place the importance of the gaining control over your health is very important. Amen. I, I fully agree. And I'm really eager to get into the conversation about understanding the difference between the two completely contrary paradigms. And you've, you'll be able to share with us how that has made a significant difference in your family's life. Um, yes. Lady, yeah. Yeah. And um, you guys are a perfect team. I think that you're a blessing to each other and to everyone around you. But thankfully, you're the perfect combo because Lady is here largely because yes. of Patrick's interest in alternative and natural medicine. So lady, do you want to introduce yourself and tell a little bit of your background story? Sure. Absolutely. Hi everyone. Um, I'm lady Hamilton. Um, and you, you can see that's my beautiful husband, but you know, there's before I even go into like, this is all the things. So first of all, God, I put God, everything, you know, through God, we were able to find amazing pathways and be able to save this, save ourselves or be able to heal our bodies. But, you know, it's amazing because through our education and we're telling you about our education because God specifically put those into our pathways as we have learned now. Um, I have, we both started with uh, associates, you know, and then we, we found uh, other ways. I got um, gifted a wonderful scholarship that I got to go and do a double major, which is in art and in mm -hmm. um, Latin American studies because our children are of that descent. Um, as you have been told that we were foster parents and ended up adopting this um these beautiful children that we were literally given like 10 bags of medicine and said they were going to die soon. So you have to understand how tragic this was. And our, our extent was enormous. So we started going to school just to find relief and relieving each other. Um, but it's amazing because as I was doing something on the side with my undergraduate, Columbia and Harvard came after me and I chose Columbia because Patrick's great grandfather is Alexander Hamilton and I'm an artist. Oh, so yeah. Stuff to, to benefit education on the side, to showing these children how they have a future of what they wanted. And so that's what they came after me for. So I have a master's in art and a master's in um, education. And it's amazing what those pathways has been able to give us because it led me to be able to open up a school and have something like that. And it led Patrick to the health. And as we're seeing today, what are the two most major problems we see? You know, um, there's a lot, but education is definitely in the forefront and so is our health. Yeah. And it's just amazing, right? It's amazing when you sit there and, and I, I said a prayer last, well, I always say prayers, but I wanted to get to know the Savior more last year. And it's funny because he just kind of walked me through like this path was for a reason. I wanted to show you all of this so that I could trust in you to do this next venture. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. So here we are. And I don't know if you want me to go into this now or later. But as I was graduating from Columbia, boy, did I get attacked. And I can go into whenever you're ready. But that is when we're, what we're talking about of my life getting saved so I could be here with everybody today. That's just that is fascinating. Um, and we do. Oh, it's hard to know where to start. But I do want to start with you and what you've gone through, lady. And then I really would love to talk about the children as well. I know that we're not going to show pictures and talk at length, but we're very curious about their story as well. But let's start with yours. Okay. So um, it was unbelievable. When I came home from Columbia, first of all, it was probably some of the most depressed time I'd ever been in my life thinking I'm going to go to graduate school. And I graduated valedictorian and, and I've never been so down and ill in my entire life. But shortly after I got home, I ended up having jaundice all over my body and my legs were even becoming paralyzed to the point where I couldn't even hardly walk. I had to have canes or walkers. And sometimes, you know, with the grace of my husband helping me to do so. And as we went to doctors, all they could tell us is she's dying from pancreatic cancer. And he's going, wait a minute, she doesn't even drink really. I mean, you no, know, I mean, so sparingly, yeah. but not enough to have stage four pancreatic cancer and to die in a few months. But all they could do, even after the test, um, 
was like, well, that's not what's coming up. You know, we're not seeing any signs of this, but here, here's all these medications for pain and whatever inflammation, anything they could give me before I died. Um, and my husband and I, this was during 2020, everyone. So you couldn't really go anywhere or do anything, but he was working like, like extra hours during the pandemic. Um, and so when he finally got a break, we decided to kind of go for a drive and that's how we found the area in Virginia, basically we're at now, but we made a crazy list to be honest with you. If you could have whatever you want, you know, per se, what would that be? And I was like, I'd like to have a beautiful home with acreage. I'd like to be able to grow food. I'd love to have great neighbors. And you guys might think that's crazy, but in our journey, we've had horrible neighbors, like shoot your dogs kind of neighbors. Right. Wow. So that was prioritized, you know, on the list. And and just all these little things of, and not even a few months later, here we are moving to Virginia. And the second house I saw is like, I knew this was the one. And a mile down one way are our local ranchers, our beef, you know, our meat vendors. And another mile down the other way is our local produce people. It was really important for Patrick, you know, he was like, you know what? let's just detox you from all this. Let's try to get your body to start getting gr really good nutrients. And yeah. I'm not talking organic from a store. I'm talking farm grown food. And we even have a local dairy, which is unbelievable. So in a matter of a few weeks, it was the jaundice was gone. I was able to start wow. feeling my legs again. And I always say that through God, right? This is why I always credit him first. You yeah. know, gave my husband the ability to say, let's try this. What do you have to lose? If you're going to die, you're going to die. Why not try to make your body feel better? And through his education and studies, he was able to say, okay, I mean, there's a few little, you know, things I want you to take. I want you to make sure you have extra magnesium in your diet and extra zinc in your diet to help build that back up. But really you got to give credit to the, the non-toxic food. And what we found out is I, you know, I cannot handle that. Even to this day, if I even try to go out to eat and he'll tell you, I get sick. It may not be as significant, but I get sick. You and feel so, it. Right. And you guys, I couldn't grow a garden right off the bat. I had to wait until like the next year or so forth to start doing that, you know, but, but I love my local vendors, my local farmers, because I tell them every week too, when I go see them, like you're literally saving my life and they have again, all, all through God here, but my husband to be so beautifully educated and to be inspired to go this path, we have seen firsthand how I'm here today. You know, I am, I'm so grateful for the beautiful blessing, but God wasn't done with me. Oh, he was not <laughs> done with me. And, you know, here we are. And so we have these ventures, you know, and this is basically where we're at at this point with me and going strong, everyone going strong. And it's all due to good, clean, nutritious food. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, th that is fascinating. Um, it's, now some people, some people still, even with all of the good, wonderful food in their, in their daily diet still have issues, but you overcame really serious things just by switching. Had you been eating a decent diet before that or, well, or what you consider, would consider fairly good? Okay. So <laughs> And I'm not trying to down on anything, you know, or, you know, I'm not trying to be your doctor either, but yeah. I mean, we went to the grocery store and our biggest thing too, and you'll see that when you talk about our kids and how it helped them, we always try to stay on the outside of the aisles. Doesn't mean right. we always be like that. We've had cheeseburgers or we do pizza or things like that, but I even mm -hmm. was a, a chef before all of this. So I'm yeah. already used to cooking my own food from scratch. Mm -hmm. And I grew up knowing how to can and do all these amazing things too, but I was noticing that even our foods and I've had um, everyone, I have a show too, but I've had people come on even talking about the dangers of organic foods at the stores. So I'm still putting, they're spraying stuff in, they're injecting our meats, they're doing whatever, you know, it's, it's horrifying. And my body cannot handle that. I mean, even when I go a few weeks without getting my, you know, my meat for the year, I get yeah. sick. And so it's what, you know, but even getting like coffees and teas, we got to be careful on, um, you know, it, just down to the, the thing. But the main thing is to stay away from the central aisles. 
Stay away from the chips, the cereals, the breads. Oh my gosh, they're so poisoned right now in the stores. Oh my, yes. Staying away from all of that. And if you have to do anything, please try to stay on the outsides. And that was our number one thing. But then as we read labels, you have to understand, so I'm, I'm not able to walk, so I'm in those chairs or those um, electronic chairs at the grocery store. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm seeing a lot of things on the, the bottom aisles and I'm reading a lot of ingredients. And we even see that with bottled water and well, not plastic's not a great thing either. But when you see bottled water and it's got a million different de- ingredients in it, or 10 even. And it's water. Spring, Right. It's supposed to be just water, but it's not. Right. And so we really got a deep dive and we've tried to be more like that. Luckily we have a well, um, we've had that before. We had the kids too. We were in a situation very much like this, but I can't do it. I can't do anything processed. And you know, if you can't pronounce it, you probably should be putting it in your body. Um, yeah. But it's even more extreme now where I, like I said, I can't even go out to a restaurant. We've tried farm to table restaurants. Yeah. And then the most of their stuff might be that. Then they'll have a can of something that they use for a sauce or butter or whatever flavoring. And my body instantly can tell. And I'm like, oh, wow. right. So we may not get to go out like everyone does, but we, we do different things or we'll pack a picnic. But I cannot. I cannot handle that very well. But we're so we're, we try to always eat better than, you know, than I guess I should say most but staying away from those foods. And it started with our children, you know, and getting their health care. But um, being at, at Columbia was a huge problem for me because where do you go get fresh? And I had a lot of things that I would have delivered to me because number one, it was so expensive to even eat from a grocery store there. I mean, milk was like $9 a gallon. You know, you're like, what? Yeah. So I would use like Amazon and Walmart or whatever, just to kind of feed me. And there's probably another problem, right? Because now I'm getting more junk into my diet, even though I was eating very little or so, it was killing me. It was just literally killing me. Wow. I wonder if maybe something in your faraway background, maybe childhood uh, made you more susceptible to, to getting sick from things that you were putting into your body intentionally or not. And I also wonder if that isn't the state of most people today and they just don't realize it. Patrick, you're definitely shaking your head. Do you want to, to talk about that for a moment? So I, I don't know that I can necessarily elaborate as far as the rest of society goes, but I can definitely tell you you're on the right track as far as, as, far as my wife goes. So she says that she used to be a chef. So she actually started out as a pastry chef. And one of the things that we found out is that she is celiac uh, allergic. And Mm -hmm. a lot of that is exactly what was causing some of these issues that she was going on with. With that being said, it wasn't the only issue, but it was definitely a huge contributor to what was going on with her. And so, yeah, I think that her time with the baking and, and everything else while she was doing okay at that time, if, if, and we've talked about this, if you look back, hindsight always being 2020, right. you can actually start picking up things in your past that at the time you just kind of wrote off as, oh, I'm just not feeling well today, or the weather's getting me, or you, you always can find yeah. an excuse for what's going on especially when you have a chronic issue, something that takes place over a very large amount of time. It it creeps up on you. And until it gets to the point of devastating you, you always find excuses for what's going on. You, You don't, people don't have the ability to listen to their bodies the way that we did three and four or 500 years ago. Yeah. And I think, I, I think too, that, um, a lot of times or a lot of people today, probably most people are used to feeling a certain way and it's not actually good, but they don't know that it's not good because it's just all they've always felt. And so maybe they feel something more when they've consumed something even worse or their body's beginning to really be overburdened. But um, I, I well, don't that, think- that and I see... I- from the patients that I see in the hospitals and stuff, I can tell you that a lot of them are very willing 
to take the detriments that go along with the choice of foods that they're taking. So for instance, obese people, I have, I have worked on bariatric floors where people are going to trying to lose the excess weight. I have talked to patients that are just fine with where they're at in the level of obesity. And the, the thing that I find is just like every other disease, there are, is a certain amount of acceptability that they're willing to do, especially in today's healthcare, because it, you remember when cell phones first came out, the, the big terminology was there's an app for that. Yes. In healthcare, it's more like there's a pill for that. Yeah. And the problem is, is people see that there's a pill for that. And while you hear people making fun of that big, huge, long list at the end of those commercials of things that it can cause, mm -hmm. they just make fun of it. They don't understand that those that list is really there for a reason. The, the, they aren't there because they, we just think it might someday do it. They're there because it has happened. Yeah. Yeah. And, and more than what they even acknowledge in those commercials. I sometimes uh, when we're watching a movie and there's, you know, that comes on, right. I, I'm just appalled. And I'll look at my husband and I'll say, can you believe that people actually still take that stuff? Because the sig most significant part of that commercial is all of these things mm -hmm. that might but, happen. So I have to interject because we're so proud of our youngest because she sees right through that. And she really wants to be a nurse like my husband. Oh, and she's good. like, so she notices that everything causes suicidal tendencies. And she's like, so this is a pill that helps with depression, but you can cause suicide. And I'm like, you're reading this, you're hearing this. I'm like, yay. <laughs> Yeah, it just makes so much sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. Wow. So just like I, people become apathetic about how they feel from the fake food, bad food, processed food that they consume, it's the same with with pills, uh, with but, modern medicine. Um, well, which they, I think that people have gotten lazy and uh, they have gotten, I mean, you're basically talking about a drug. Yeah. Food is a drug. And yeah. when you have these, in, a, a full industry of food providers that have figured out a way to make that drug even more intoxicating for you, create more of that dopamine effect in order mm -hmm. to get you even more addicted on the things that they know aren't healthy in the first place then you're talking about an industry that has taken control over the most basic fundamental ability that people have or need. So right. it, it's no wonder that the pharmaceutical industry is doing such a massive job at being able to keep you hooked on pills when you have the food industry that is keeping you hooked on the need for those pills. And all for profit, not because they care about you. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. that, that food addiction thing, it's not because they're making food more healthy, more clean. It's because they're adding things to it that make you addicted to it. And we right. just, just the opposite of healthy. And then we become addicted to the drugs. Yeah. Which yeah. is not how God designed us to be at all. Well, you know, it wasn't even that long ago that we didn't even have regular granulated sugar. The way that we would actually sweeten things was naturally through things like honey. And yeah. we have gotten to the point now that we can, everything is such a convenience for us that we can look past the detriment that it's actually doing to us because it's only a little bit right now. You go back to that chronic thing, you only feel a little bit off, you only feel a little bit off, and you keep feeling a little bit off until it's overwhelming. And then you go to your doctor and say, you know, I've really been kind of just not feeling well, or my blood pressure is a little bit high. So they start feeding you with the pills. And they put the cloak over your eyes that everything is going great with your nutrition. We just have a pill to take care of it. It's amazing how many patients I get when I ask them if they have hypertension or if they have high blood pressure or anything like this, and they tell me no. And then I ask them, well, why are you on this medication or that medication? Oh, well, that's because I used to have diabetes or I used to have hypertension. Mm. Well, no, you still have it. You're just taking a pill for it in order yeah. to manage. 
Right. So, and that's where the money comes in. Yeah. And, and there are billions and billions and billions of dollars in that very thing. So we have a food system that makes us sick and a medical system that keeps us sick and dependent. It just doesn't dependent. work. And now I, I will say quickly, I'm just going to in interject. Last week, I interviewed Melissa Guzman about her little guy who had leukemia, and they eventually were able to clear him and make him strong and healthy by, uh, they stepped away. They were able eventually to step away from, um, <laughs> from chemotherapy and all of that, and then cleanse and rebuild, and he's doing great now. But in that story, <laughs> This platform demonetized us and warned us. I expect the same thing is going to happen today. And I only bring that up not to say don't, you know, say X, Y, Z, but it's not even just the medical industry that is in on this. Oh, um, no. We are being censored all over the place. And I don't mean we personally, we are, but um as a whole, as a culture, as a nation and around the world, we can't even freely talk about this stuff, but we can, we can push all the drugs and procedures that, that are available. Right. We can't talk about non-toxic health giving, health building modalities to overcome disease and maintain disease. And that is really, really wrong, isn't it? Well, it is, especially in a system. See, the problem is, is the United States or Western medicine, however you want to say it, is falls under a system called allopathic medicine. And yeah. allopathic medicine yeah. is a system that is designed to use chemicals in order to fight different health disparities. The mm -hmm. problem is, is Chemicals, most people don't understand that these chemicals come with a cost. There is a, no chemical out there that you're putting in your body that doesn't have in some way, shape or form a detrimenting cost involved. And we're starting to, by we, I mean, Western medicine is starting to open up their eyes a little bit more to the holistic style medicines, the natural style things that have been going on. But I can tell you as somebody that is in the healthcare environment all the time, there's two problems. Number one, we have a system and you're right. It's not just the food industry. It's not just the pharmaceutical industry. It's not just the healthcare. It is a multitudes of different things all combined into one. We have the issue that while yes, we have a, a system that is designed around the need for these medications, getting rid of these medications has almost become an impossibility without slowly diverting outside of. For instance, my wife, while we got her off of all of her medications, it took a very long time to do it. It took a lot of work with the doctors in order for that to happen. It wasn't like I just stepped in and said, look, okay, we're cutting off everything right now and we're just going this path. You still have to make sure that you're getting the labs works. You make sure that you're getting following up with your doctors and, and slowly coming off of these medicines, not just abruptly stopping them. Because if you abruptly stop them, then you're going to be in worse shape than what you were when you started them. Yes, and I, I understand that that is typically the issue. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I may be, <laughs> but uh, we got my husband off of statins, off of Lipitor immediately once he left the hospital after a heart attack. Um, I had done some checking and we were in, in very close contact with our functional medicine doctor, very holistically minded. And he mm -hmm. said, statins, you can just go cold turkey. And we did. And he had no problems from that. He also weaned himself off of the blood pressure medicine, which he hadn't even actually had high blood pressure, as I recall. Um, but, you know, that's just standard treatment. Uh, right. So you, you indicated that he had heart problems. And a lot of times your blood pressure medications aren't necessarily there for the blood pressure that is a secondary or 
I mean, if they're using it for blood pressure, then it would be a primary. But many times, if you've had heart problems, they put you on what they call beta blockers because it makes the reason that it helps the blood pressure is because of the, the way that it affects the heart. Hmm. With that being said, statins, you're absolutely right. I hate statins with a passion. And yeah. the, the problem that I see with statins is that they decrease the LDLs, which we are on one of those kicks from what I see. We are on one of those kicks like we were in the 70s when the worst thing that you could put in your mouth was an egg. Yeah. And we seem to be on one of those kicks with your, your cholesterol. Yep. Now, what your doctors aren't telling you is that that LDL that they're saying is the bad cholesterol is in mm -hmm. virtually every cell in your body. You, yeah. it, it is what designs your cell. It is what creates that outer layer of that cell that holds it together. And if you start bringing that LDL down too much, then you start having dysfunctions with things like your steroids your natural immunity that, that relies on those, the cholesterol that's in your body. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, granted, there are some people that I always say there's exceptions to every rule, mm -hmm. but that is one of those medications that is so, so widely overused. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think that it's causing more harm than good. I agree. And thankfully, my husband agrees. And we'll we'll go into his story another time. I, I may actually, if he's agreeable, interview him so we can talk about his story. But that, that aside, um, I only know of one medication that can actually be helpful and has no ill side effects. And that is low dose naltrexine. My father used it when, when we were helping him overcome cancer, and it has very strong anti-carcinogenic properties. I was well aware of that. I'd heard doctors speak about it and done, read a book and all of that. Anyway, so when my dad asked me to help him with the cancer, I did find a doctor who would prescribe. I, I now know you don't have to. We actually got it from my husband, too. Um, but we found a doctor near him who prescribed the low dose naltrexine and also oversaw the non-toxic natural modalities that we were using. Um, and low dose naltrexone is the same as high dose, which is used to get people off of opiate addictions. But at low dose is the only thing it does uh, negatively, if you can call it negative, and my dad confirmed this, was uh, it, it caused vivid dreams. So that's the only pharmaceutical that I know that actually doesn't have negative consequences and actually does really help people with a variety of problems, especially, of course, cancer, but also some arthritic and, and other things. We only used it for that. And uh, George tried it for his rheumatoid arthritis and didn't find that it helped him. But um, that aside, I just don't know of any other pharmaceuticals that don't have really negative side effects and that then cause other problems. And so, as you know, there's a drug for everything because this causes a problem and then you have to have a drug for that. And pretty soon you have this whole collage of problems and a whole menagerie of pharmaceuticals to deal with those symptoms. So none of these yeah, things are actually helping us. They're not addressing cures, just like having a pan stage four pancreatic diagnosis and sending you home with a bag full of pills, lady. That doesn't actually help you, does it? Right. Because it never addresses a problem. <sighs> I really... Um, that, that, is, that is one of the biggest problems that I see as a, a person in the healthcare system is we tend to address more of the symptoms than we do the actual problems in the first place. Right. For instance, I do, I do a huge spiel on hypertension. Hypertension, I have had this argument with many providers. The, from everything that I've learned, hypertension should not be considered a, a disease, but they still do consider it a disease. 
But if you do the root cause of hypertension, somewhere along the line, it's always a, a, a symptom of something else that's going on. Yeah. For, for instance, hypertension can be caused because your kidneys are starting to go bad. But we don't even look at your kidneys going bad until they're at least 60% bad. Ugh. So for your, your blood pressure to be going up and your kidney function to be within that 60 to 100% range, well, everything's within normal limits. So it must just be what they call essential hypertension or something that we just don't know what the cause is. Well... We're, we're not doing a good job at explaining to patients all the way around that everything is interrelated. Yeah. And when it comes to medications, the, again, there's a, there's a pill for everything. And you, there is, and you um, just touched on something else that to me is very important. And that is that the, our medical current medical paradigm looks at uh, not only just symptoms, but, separate systems of the body without looking at it as a whole. And I've seen that firsthand. It drives me nuts. Um, my dad with his cancer, he had a doctor for this, a doctor for that, a doctor for the other thing. And they all communicated online via his, uh, they had, a, you know, an online doctor's right. thing. And I, at first I thought, well, at least they're talking to each other, but they really weren't. They really weren't. And the thing that ended up killing my dad, I believe, it was one of two things. He either, either just gave up hope totally, which I actually think is the thing, or uh, at any rate, um, what they had done to him in the operating room should have been a big signal to the, the all the doctors that, man, he's got a severely damaged pancreas now we better watch his blood sugar. And maybe this is one time when I might've actually said, you know, maybe he needs some help with insulin because he was on a very low carb diet for the cancer. But when you've got a damaged organ, why can't they just look at the whole picture? And that is of course what functional and holistic medicine does, but most of our medical system does not. Am I correct? So you are, but if you, if you think back to your childhood or even your parents' childhood, they did. Yeah. The healthcare, the healthcare system as a whole, while nursing itself still tries to cling on to that whole analogy of mind, body, and spirit, the mm -hmm. there is there is much more to a person than just a heart there's much more to a person than just a kidney but right. when it came to your providers they had to segregate them into categories because the, the world of medicine just exploded with knowledge so vast that it's almost impossible for any one type of provider to keep up with all the advancing technologies and the advances in the medicines and the advances in the procedures and everything that's going on. And you really start seeing that in the late 70s, more 80s, but even most so with Obamacare. Obamacare really started opening up the channels for all these different professions to be able to provide a service and hand you off to another provider with that same ability without really ever communicating other than, like you said, in the computer, just what's yeah. in that computer. It used to be when I grew up, I can vividly remember that if I got sent to a surgeon, then that surgeon did all of the reporting through your primary doctor. If you got sent to any specialist in any way, shape or form, you almost never really talked to that specialist other than just in the moment. Mm -hmm. That specialist conveyed everything to your primary doctor. Your primary doctor would generally provide any medications or help to set up any kind of physical therapy or anything like that. Everything went through your primary doctor. That's not the case anymore. Half the time, your primary doctor doesn't even know that you just had a major cardiovascular surgery unless you're the one that told them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and to me, that is probably one of the biggest detriments of healthcare society that we have today is there is no communication. Like you said, there's no communication between these doctors, between these providers, between the different healthcare entities that are out there that are supposed to be giving you that whole balanced care the the segregates you into pieces and just like you said they don't look at the the whole whole person that's coming in how are these things interrelated near as much as what they should yeah and it's to our detriment Very i remember much. yeah when i was young we had a primary we had a general practitioner and there right. were way more general practitioners than there are now. Now there are specialists and special specialists within specialties. I was listening uh, last week to uh, Allie Beth Stuckey on her um, uh, relatable podcast. I like to listen to her and she interviewed a doctor. Um, and that is exactly what she was saying. Now they're there. She's a doctor. She's a specialist in I don't remember what, but now they're even going further into specialties within specialties and everything becomes even more segregated. Yeah. So, you know, my, my dad with the pancreatic cancer thing, um, uh, two months, three months, well, almost four months later, um, four months later, he was cancer free, but soon before that, um, he had an, a neurologist who was treating him for the incredible, horrible pains that were shooting down his leg and sending him into the emergency room at night. Um, and, and then they would, couldn't figure out what was wrong and they'd prescribe him steroids. Okay. So you've got mm -hmm. the damage, you've got half of a pancreas, it's damaged and healing you're having these shooting horrible neurological pains. They put you on steroids. What happens when you're put on steroids? Your blood sugar level goes sure. through the roof. Sure. And then the whole problem with the neurological, uh, the whole neurological problem was that he had high blood sugar because he had a yeah. damaged pancreas. But the endocrinologist and the surgeon and all and the general, you know, all of that, they didn't make that connection. And one day the uh, the neurologist came in. I was sitting with my dad after another one of these episodes in the uh, uh, rehab center. And the neurologist says, well, I know what your problem is. You're diabetic. I just rolled my eyeballs like, are you kidding me? That's not the problem. The problem started way back in August of the year before with this whole surgery. Anyway, that just uh, is to me a very clear example of how disconnected the medical system is. And because but, of that, we get more and more and more screwed up. Yeah. Lady, I'm so glad you were able to get out of that. And Patrick, that you could help her, that you see that and that you're stepping back from that and trying to take really a, a totally different approach and, and really change things. And what I hope to see is more and more people like you saying, we've got to stop this madness, get off this wheel and, um, and go back to doing things the way that we should be doing. But then that, you has, know, to happen, that has to happen at a societal level. It I does. Mean, we were, we, we were able to come out here and we had to really search. We live, while we live in Southern Virginia, it's, it's not necessarily always the easiest. Where we went to, we had to specifically look for those types of things in order to find a place to live. The yeah. vast majority of people, when they move from place to place, these aren't the types of criteria that they look at when they're, look, when they're moving. And they end up, for lack of better terminology, they're stuck with what they've got in their area without the ability to provide for themselves. And most people don't yeah. have the acreage or even the knowledge on how to provide this food for themselves. So unless you have that stuff, to, and, and in the way that society is rolling today, they aren't even showing you that this is a problem. 
that is what I end up spending the vast majority of my time with, with my patients at these hospitals, is trying to explain to these people that most of their health problems are all because of the choices that are being forced in front of people and the, they're being blinded from the, the types of choices that would actually help them without necessarily having to go to the doctor all the time, without having the detriments in the first place. And, and we're also forced into these systems like Obamacare. Uh, my family has no insurance. We have done health shares in the past, but we have no insurance. We're, we, haven't, we don't do Obamacare because we don't believe in it. Um, but parents and families are forced into this and they don't have options. I'm thankful that now, uh, maybe this is something, Patrick, that you're thinking about, and if not, I hope you will, but there now are a lot of membership programs where alternative-minded practitioners open up clinics and families and individuals can buy a membership. And that membership gets them either um, via the internet or in-person meetings with doctors, nurses, practitioners, and testing and whatever, all the guidance without the invasiveness of the allopathic um, the allopathic medical system that causes often so much harm. So right. just a little poke there. Maybe you'll think about that because we need more. There um, was actually there was actually a huge community in the central California area where they had a full on town that did exactly that. They set up oh. all of their food in a, a way that it was kind of a community type sharing. All of the healthcare was set up in a community type sharing. They set it up so that the exactly what you were talking about, everybody just pays a certain amount each year, each month, month. or however it was set up so that people were able to yeah, in order to sustain, but it wasn't it wasn't set up in a way that profit was the ultimate goal. It was set up that health and prosperity was the ultimate goal. And I think that that's uh -huh. where a lot of society today is at a huge disparity because profit is such the ultimate goal in society that you I don't foresee any time, at least in my lifetime, that we're going to be able to separate that profitability from the detriments of health that have overwhelmed our, our current society. Wow. With that being said, though, that is your passion, and that is exactly what he's been working towards, is, is to exactly start something. Um, oh, yeah. And he's in the basis of that so that he can continue and provide this alternate um avenue for for families and, and and people in the communities because if they don't know it's it's re-educating is a lot of it too you've got to re-educate people and say you know you got to see this you got to try this because i mean i grew up too it's like whatever the doctor said was right mm -hmm. you know whatever you know if the doctor said so you followed it you know he was god yeah. and so you have to kind of understand no no, you know, they're, they're, they're practicing medicine. They're re still researching this. Everything is still opening up. We and should think about that term practicing. Right. Yes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. I can um, overemphasize that term. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause a, a lot of it is practicing. I remember my dad telling me that when he was a kid, he remembered that there was the town doctor I remember there being a few doctors, but not a plethora of them. But he said he can remember where when a family needed a doctor, you might pay him in chickens <laughs> or vegetables because families didn't often, especially through the Depression area, they grew up in the 30s, uh, 30s, 40s, late 30s and 40s. Um, you know, people didn't have money and doctors weren't in it to become wealthy uh, they were actually in it to help people. And so they would often get paid just in practical ways, which were doable for families. But we certainly are far, far away from that now. The The system that you described, Patrick, out in California, that sounds very appealing to me. 
But um, let's shift gears for a moment here. I want to talk about the children that you have adopted and how you've, what kinds of issues that they have and how you've been able to address those to help them. I first want to ask, are they siblings? Yes. Okay. Yes. I suspected as much. Um, and please only talk as much as you're comfortable um, with them. Well, it, it's not that we're not comfortable talking. It's, it's, we just protect their identity. Yes. Um, being uh, being adopted children. And you have to understand when I said that they were drug babies, um, even though they were drugged and fed poisons and stuff, it's kind of like, um, go ahead and rape my child as payment for our drug habit. That's what I mean. So that's the kind of villain we're protecting them from. So you have to wow. understand. Okay. So, um, but when we were given them, you know, we had no idea. And, you know, we here's all this medicine. And I mean, my son was 25 pounds at seven years old. He was the, he's the oldest and he was 25 pounds and he could barely lift his head off the ground. He couldn't see, couldn't walk, couldn't whatever. Basically couldn't take care of him at all. Couldn't feed himself. You know, it, it just had no strength whatsoever. The girls were just as sick. Um, the youngest was three and not even a month or two after having her, she had to have surgery on every single tooth. Now you have to understand the middle daughter at five was the mother. And she was literally doing anything she could to feed them and take care of them, which means she would go in and steal food from the closest place she could walk to, which is usually a gas station or whatever. So she's grabbing chips and whatever and candy and everything to feed these poor babies. She, don't, she doesn't know. She's five. And, you know, so, right. And they were just basically left to tend for themselves until they were needed. So wow. their, their diet already started off horrible. And again, yeah. treating symptom after symptom. So when we got them, they had a lot of these different creams, a lot of these steroids, um, cortisones and everything. We had to layer them with all of these different medications. And then yet they couldn't fight off of anything without getting MRSA every single time. Not even a common, they get MRSA. Germs touch them, MRSA. And so we have to bleach our house down and the children almost daily. And we wow. did it for years. And so, and, and then being the foster ki children, we didn't, you don't really have a choice. You have to follow what the state says, every vaccine, right. every medicine, whatever, you know, that they needed to have. But we ran into an amazing specialist at the Children's Foundation. And I, we started kind of working with these different things and doing things a little different. And kind of like, hush, hush. She goes, whatever you're doing, keep doing. Uh, but the first thing that we started with is we have got to get you guys regular food. And they fought us. Oh, did, did they not fight us? Don't make me eat salad sandwiches. We call them vegetarian, right? That was like the worst torture in their life. You're like, what is that? A vegetable? <laughs> You know, and so it was really a fight to get them. And we got them very quickly into the fact that we would have broccoli wars on how, who would eat all the broccoli and who would eat it. But the first thing that we, we went for is, you know, healthy habits, healthy food. Yeah. And we had the ability to, to do those kind of things. And in the area, too, with a lot of, of um, farm grown, wonderful things around us. So building up their body from the inside. Um, but when we adopted them, that changed a lot of things too. I didn't, we didn't have to use the steroids. We didn't have to use the things. And we went, he's like, as long as you could just use, if you need extra grease, use Vaseline. It could be that simple. Take oatmeal baths, which we were already giving them anyway, real oatmeal baths because yeah. they have Ethiopia, Ethiopia, it's called IFAP, Ethiosis Focularis Alopecia Photophobia. So we call it even allergic to the sun because they couldn't go out without all these different, I mean, Suntan mm -hmm. lotions, long sleeves, umbrellas, hats, you name it, because they would get burnt to a crisp. So it was very, very intense, very intense wow. taking care of these kids. So when we got them adopted, it was uh, we had the ability to say, okay, yeah, we can. We don't have to put all these creams on you, so therefore they weren't getting burnt as much. We got to use oils instead of steroids. We got to, um, you know, all of a sudden, whatever I was doing, he's like, you need to patent that instead of being... <laughs> remanded for for that you know but it was just again with you know patrick being in in and he started taking nursing school and stuff at this time too and and yeah. when we got to regenerate these kids and get them the vitamins and proteins and so forth that they need just so that they have healthy bodies because they couldn't even fight off there was no sharing and this is something too imagine kids who cannot share toys blankets nothing you couldn't touch it you couldn't do whatever separate combs separate everything i mean just it was that bad. So oh, we had to really rebuild their bodies so they could even fight off of infection stuff themselves. Their bodies could fight that off. 
And so of God and then my beautiful husband helping to do this. But we had to start from point zero and go from there. Um, now they're thriving, beautiful. I mean, they with ethiosis too, our girls had like no hair. And we would go into places where they would put like, um, not like a shock treatment. So I don't want to freak everyone out, but it would stimulate their, their, their um, hair follicles. So they would start growing healthy stuff and eating great thing and putting, you know, wonderful um, oils and stuff on them. All of a sudden they have the strongest, most beautiful hair. Now my son having full ethiosis, will, he has no, I mean, grows hair, but it falls right out, but not very long what you would see. So he's completely bald everywhere. But how do we protect that? How do you know? And they are amazingly healthy children now. Um, how long has it been? 15, how long? Have... 15, 16 oh. years, right? Honey? Okay. Yeah. So, and they were three, five, and seven at this time. Now they're, you know, my son, and we've talked about this before too, because he's legally blind, you know? And so their, you know, the answer for that with education was just, he's not going to mount anything. Just put him in front of a museum oh. and sit. He's now going to school. He's written books. He, you know, wants to be a teacher. He wants to be an actor. He wants to do all these things. And he can do this because we've showed him a different way. So we had to not only physically heal them, we had to mentally heal them. Oh, I am sure. And it, it, it's been a chore, you know, and it, it, it's funny because what we, like I said, they would laugh about vegetable sandwiches, but yet you can go and get a vegetarian sub somewhere at Subway or whatever you want to do, you know, and people yeah. don't freak out about it, but they did. And then we did things like fish oil. Right, mm -hmm. cod liver oils was a huge benefit. Not only did it help their bodies and their hearts, but it helped their because they're like, oh, they have HDHD, and they wanted to label them with all of that kind of stuff. And boy, did that not handle that, did it not? Right, dear. Yes, it was unbelievable the benefits of that. So we really went a different route with them to to be here with us and have a healthy, wonderful life. And if you want to go into more of that medically, um, you could do so better than I can, sweetheart. But I'll, I'll tell you, it it was a major chore. He can ask you because every single day we'd have to bleach down everything because they couldn't share, they couldn't whatever. And then we couldn't even find babysitters because nobody could handle all of this stuff. Or we yeah. go to church. Oh, and they have to have separate seats. Nobody and wanted to. Kids and, and nobody wanted to. Nobody, they're like, no way. But wow. people like, what do you mean they can't share? No, not at schools too. We'd have their IEP meetings going they'd have to Clorox wipe their desks. And if they wanted to share toys or materials in the school, the kids either had to have their own or they'd have to Clorox wipe and get all rid of all the germs before my kids could even touch them. And Clorox, of course, is not a good thing either. But but you're no. talking about just severe sensitivity to pathogenic organ organisms. Right. Yeah. And they've had mercy well, so somewhat. bad. So Right. So a lot okay. of what we're actually talking about is the, I hate to say, the state's view of the pathogenic organs that were detrimental to these children. The problem that I found in the more that I studied and the more that we researched these children, their special conditions, the ointments and everything that we were putting on them, I think we were doing more damage than good. While, yeah. number one, you definitely don't want to be using long-term steroids on anybody, especially yeah. not children that are growing and developing that you say are going to have these types of issues, the, the, the steroids are going to be more detrimental in the long term than they are helpful in the short term. But right. one of the things that she doesn't talk about is a building up of the immune system. One of the, the biggest advantages that I tell people to this day is that when we got these children, we were living on a mini farm. And uh, I would have these children going That's out great. there and oh, wow. up with, hey, you're cleaning up after the chickens and all of these things that they were doing helps in every little way to help build their immune systems back up. And between right. the healthy foods, the you're doing the, the chores in areas that were introducing them to the types of bacteriums and everything that actually create a healthy body. Well, like she said, we couldn't do a whole lot until after we had actually adopted them. But once we adopted them, it was on. We, we yeah. totally got rid of almost every cream other than we couldn't totally get rid of the creams because of the ichthyosis. But yeah. we were able to get rid of all the steroids 
And we would use things like exfoliants in order to help with the ichthyosis. We would use things like Vaseline or CeraVe in order to help keep the, the skin somewhat moist. My wife was absolutely brilliant when it came to helping to the, the girls with their hair, being able to bring the, the nutrition back into them. And like she said, the youngest one, she was so nutrient deficient that she had to have surgical procedures on every single one of her teeth at three years old. She had to have them completely, not only covered with the capping them, but painting them in order to not have silver teeth at three years old. By the time that those baby teeth were falling out and being replaced by natural teeth this this girl had a beautiful smile mm -hmm. she oh, actually wow. started getting the nutrients and she to this, yeah to this day she is still our biggest solid no thank you but <laughs> we were able to we were able to take and rather than just having a salad per se one of the things that we did was like a salad sandwich make it more like a food that she may be more accustomed to. And trust me, there were a lot of fights over that one too. But she would end up being like the individual Everyone. like cucumbers, absolutely. Yeah. And eventually we were able to start getting them to eating all the different vegetables. We found out that her biggest dislike was the leafy things. Well, okay, we can accommodate that. We can provide all different kinds of things that, that you don't have to have those leafy things. And right. uh, like she said, we're, they're, they're all beautiful, healthy children to this day as a direct result of it. That is yeah. wonderful. I, I know that you know that it's you To some are extent, to her favor. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, she she was very much like she could eat cucumbers till the cows come home and love pickles and all that stuff. She hates salad dressing. So to some extent, how can I really cite her for that? You know, even if I'm making it myself, you know, it's just, you know, all these extra yeah. whatever. So I can't really say that, but she's, she's not really, she's more of a vegetable platter kind of girl. So when we do salads, we would set it up because she loves peppers. She loves cucumbers, just not the leafy green kind of thing, you know. So yeah. that is kind of a difference to them. But I couldn't even, I wasn't even allowed to even cut their hair. So, I mean, right. And you just see like it started growing really well and all the scraggly, whatever. So the first thing I did when they were done, I'm like, can I go get the girl's hair cut? And they're like, sure. You know, and it was just amazing to see all that dead and all the beautiful hair that had grown in the stead, you know? Oh, wow. So it was, it was fabulous. <laughs> You've done amazing things with them. I I just can't even imagine. I'm sitting here picturing what they what they must have looked like and how far they have come because of what you've done with them. And obviously you're a huge blessing to them and I'm sure that they realize that, but what a strong testament to what just eating good food and living a better life can do for someone. And um Patrick, I, I was reminded of studies that I've read about how kids playing barefoot in the dirt build strong immune systems because we are yeah. supposed to be exposed to yeah. a wide variety of organisms that naturally occur. And when you're living in an isolated, sterile environment, that doesn't happen. And then the body is more susceptible to illness in addition to all of the other horrible insults to their physical right and emotional states i can't even imagine the emotional state either um and i hope that they're they're all doing i'm sure that you've had to help them a lot with that as well yeah unfortunately oh, i think yeah, that's going to be a lifelong challenge because these kids can remember especially yeah. the older two um, especially my son um because it was also two years of battle which you you know we haven't brought up here too because the birth mom, when we'd have visitations, she was, we, we found out through the doctors, it's called mutualism by proxy. She would literally find toxins or household cleaners or whatever to poison the children, but to make them, you know, so like, look at how sick my kids are. You need to pity me and give me things so I can take care of them. And then the dad was physically and um, abusing them on his. 
So you're like, I mean, the torture that I went through, I came up, you know, the torture was horrible. I mean, Patrick can tell you, I would go out of my mind those three or four hours because even the supervised visits, they would either be dropped off. We went through seven different parent aids, you know, and as I, we fought going, are you kidding me? My kids came back beaten or burnt or bloody. And you, you guys, where was the aid? Where was the aid? Oh, well, she was sleeping in the car or she just dropped them off or she was, you're like, what? So we had no. two years of this. And I mean that, not in the customer guys, it was literally hell. And I would go out of my mind going, how are the kids being tortured right now? So um, we're very thankful that they didn't have that. But these kids, I still think, especially the older two, it's going to be a lifelong challenge. And I shouldn't d disrespect my youngest too. She's just, she was so young. Yeah. But especially my son, I mean, they were going to have to deal with these um, physical, mental realities that this happened to them before although that they are thrilled you know um to not have that life anymore and to be here and be healthy um but i don't know i think when you have that extreme abuse yeah um, and neglect it, it's going to carry with them for a lifetime there's actually another avenue that we're not going to approach right now um, but I do want to interview a couple of people about how emotional trauma um, causes many physical ailments and how you can free yourself of those. So there's, for instance, the, the book, The Emotion Code. I have another one titled Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. And those might actually be helpful resources for you as well as parents to these children. But that just is a whole nother door to open and a massive room to to step into. I've been learning a lot about that the last couple of years. And I'm I'm really blown away at what there is there. So aside from the food, the drugs and all of that stuff, you've got the emotional harm and um, it will ha continue to have an effect. But I like the emotion code in that there's a there's actually uh, the hope with a way to be able to break free from those emotional harms as well. But when the children have been traumatized to the point that yours have, that is going to take a lot of work. But I know that you're showing them real love and God's love. And that's how we can heal. Right. Um, My husband's even introduced them into um, meditation and things like this too so he's very very good about um finding those avenues and researching those avenues as well so um a lot patrick does a lot to help so patrick you are an amazing man and i'm so thankful to have been able to meet you here and hear your stories um You'll be giving a talk at our upcoming God Given Food as Medicine event, which is only three weeks away. Wow. Right. Um, it's right around so the corner. It, it really is. And I hope that, audience, that those of you listening, I hope that we'll see some of you there. It's the lineup of speakers and topics really is mind blowing. And I'm looking forward personally to coming and learning from you. And from others, I'm so thankful that God has brought us together. And honestly, people, God has brought us together. I am always amazed at how he puts people into my life and Aaron's life. And we help each other. We learn from each other. Um, and we can share in one another's troubles and triumphs. And that's just such a beautiful thing about how God designed us and his church. And I'm right. so thankful for that. But uh, we're going to um, we're going to wrap it up for now. I think we could go on and on. Right. Um, but <laughs> I'm sure that you guys have other things to do. So um, I would encourage those of you listening to check out our God given food event. I'm sorry, God given food as medicine event. We also have in the past done God, um, God given food. <laughs> so we've had a couple of themes. Um, but check that out. Uh, it's in uh, near Roanoke, Virginia, April 19th, 20th. And then the 21st is a special worship, worship service to, to close it all off. But it's going to be a wonderful event. And I'm just so very thankful and looking forward to spending time with both of you, Lady and Patrick, as well as our other speakers and guests. It's going to be, I know, a, a very 
heartwarming, encouraging time full of learning, learning and growing. So thank you so much for that. And um, with that, we're going to sign off for now. We have some more excellent interviews coming up. So um, put us on the schedule for next week at three o'clock. And uh, before we sign off, Lady and Patrick, we're putting your contact and your social media and all of that, your websites in our show notes so that you can all look up and find out more about Patrick and Lady. And Patrick will be watching to see what you do. And if you open a Thank clinic you. or I'm excited for that and eager to see what you do. So um, I am too. <laughs> well, when well, you start to leave, if I can, is so I have a school and I'm not here to like both yes. of the school. But we're already started because we're already teaching our students exactly this. So yeah. and he's a huge part of this as well. So. He's Good. I was just about to say, and and ladies' school. So, yeah, we've got that also. I think Aaron has put that in the show notes as well. Um, I actually am going to check out the school. I haven't looked at it yet. I meant to do that today. But um, that's an exciting venture as well. So you've got a lot going on. You guys are doing amazing things, and I'm very thankful for you. Thank you very much, both of you. Pleasure. And thank you thank to you. all of you who right. tuned in as well. Yeah. Yep. We're looking forward to spending time together, learning and growing. And uh, we'll share here with our audience many of the things that we learn. So, all right. We'll thank sign you. off for now and we'll see you next week.